Hello everyone, this is Luke Johnson, and I am back with Dr. Er, Jonathan Cook, the author of Inscrutable Malice. Go buy it on Amazon today. And today we're going to be talking about Herman Melville's Redburn. Uh, so, Dr. Cook, you're going to have to bring me up a little bit. I, uh, I finished this book about a couple weeks ago. Um, yeah. And I really, and, but I do have some impressions that I can share about it, is that uh, I think what was really lovely about this book, if I'm just thinking off the, uh, off the top of my head, is that you can really begin to see Melville mature as a writer here and where he's going to be going with Mel Moby Dick and so many of the other books that we've discussed. And um, I don't know, I think I really enjoyed that personally as an intellectual, as kind of watching another titan or great of thought mature in public in that way and just how it's so important to release material so that you can grow as a scholar and as a writer and as an author so those are my initial takes on it i thought it was a lovely book i thought it was in many ways really beautifully written and sets the stage for moby dick uh perfectly so um are, are what drew you to this text um well i really like redburn because um Yes, as you say, it's it's beautifully written. Um, it functions more like a traditional novel than, uh, say, Moby Dick or some of Melville's later work. Um, people have compared it to Defoe um, in terms of its uh, style. Um, I mean, lots of interesting facts about sailing a ship and... Um, about the culture of England in the, you know, about, he was actually there in 1839. Um, so early Victorian England, uh, specifically Liverpool and, and London. And uh, so it's a very um, captivating narrative because of the interesting personality of the narrator, Wellingborough Redburn, you know, who's now telling his story... Um, uh, roughly a decade after he had the experiences that he that he recounts in the book, and um, it, it has a, you know a coming of age theme that anyone can identify: a young man facing the world for the first time and dealing with all the sort of nasty discoveries that you can make as a young person in the world that you know either destroy you or they they toughen you. And um, it's also, I mean, it doesn't have a lot of traditional novelistic interaction between characters, but it has a fascinating character who shows up about two-thirds of the way through the book, uh, Harry Bolton, who's this uh, English um, kind of prodigal who joins the crew for the return voyage. You know, Redburn meets him in Liverpool, where he's um, sort of running away from uh, his uh, disastrous career as a, um, um, you know, a, someone who's wasted his inheritance and has no real family. He's an orphan. Um, so uh, it's got that fascinating character in the book. And, um, and it's a very accessible story. So a lot yeah. of people who read Moby Dick think, oh, God, I can't read Melville because he's, he's just so challenging. It's not, that his, it's not that his stories are that complex. I mean, he's not like Henry James, but he's using uh, some very uh, colorful diction and presenting some challenging philosophical ideas. Uh, but then you read Redburn and you realize that uh, you can still get a really interesting philosophical novel, but have it accessible to to a lot more readers than uh, those who get um, challenged by Moby Dick. So, yeah, that that raises an interesting question for me um, because a lot of people are aware of how familiar I am with Kierkegaard's Corpus, and they're always like, "Where do I jump in?" And yeah. I, you know, I kind of him and Hall because it's, it kind of depends on the reader that I'm talking to. You know, if it's someone more philosophically minded, I may say the philosophical fragments. Or if it's someone that may be more familiar with biblical texts, I'll, I'll say fear and trembling. Um, but that's kind of the interesting question. How do you get on the merry-go-round of Melville? Would you recommend Redburn as, as that entry point? Yeah. Or? Yeah, yeah. I, I guess you I could, maybe, you could call maybe it a, to a less experienced reader. Gate, maybe. Yeah, a, I don't know. You call it a gateway novel. You know, that's 
That's such a trendy word these days. So yeah, yeah. it's a good way to start. Although, if you really want to read Melville, you might as well just start from the beginning with Type P and just work your way up. Um, but yeah, it's a it's a it's a good book to start with to to realize that Melville was a brilliant uh, realist uh, before he became uh, a very uh, complex sort of uh, symbolic realist uh, with Moby Dick. Um, so. I, well, I, I have to say, I really enjoyed this one. I think I quoted it on my Facebook wall many times. Yeah, uh, I yeah. thought there were many passages that I could identify with or that just really resonated with me at this point in my life. So yeah. maybe you could tell us a little bit about how this novel came to be. What, what were the circumstances that led to its composition? Yeah. So it was written in um, May and June of um, 1849. Uh, maybe a little bit into July, too. Uh, supposedly it took about 10 weeks. And Melville was living in New York City. He wrote it probably in his study in his uh, house in New York on, you know, 4th Avenue around 12th Street. Um, and, uh, you know, he just published a gargantuan book called Marty, which is kind of a warm-up act for Moby Dick. Uh, very complex, fascinating uh, journey uh, through the South Seas that turns into a, a sort of ongoing philosophical dialogue between a bunch of um, Polynesian characters uh, looking around the South Seas for the lost um, sweetheart of one of the characters, um, Taji, the narrator, actually, um, who's a stand-in for Melville himself, you know, who spent years in the in the in Polynesia when he was younger. So anyway, this novel was published in the spring of 1849. It did not do very well. It was very challenging for the general reader. It got some a few positive reviews, but most people th recognized that it was just uh over the heads of most American readers at the time. So it didn't sell very well. And Melville, you know, he spent he had the luxury of spending 2 years writing this book, which is was a long time for him. And he suddenly realized that he had to write some things quick to make money for his family because now, you know, he was married, living in New York, his, his first child on the way. And uh, so he sat down in uh, starting in May 1849 and wrote two books back to back, uh, Redburn and then White Jacket, um, which is about the experiences of a young man in the U.S. Navy. Um, and uh, so by the end of the summer, he had produced two new novels. And then um, he placed one of them, uh, got it ready for publication um, in that, that, that fall. Uh, you know, Harper Brothers was his American publisher. But then he went to England in October 1849 to try to get a good deal on White Jacket with a British publisher because he wanted to you know, get a good price for that book because he, he really needed money for his, for his family. Um, so he, uh, he was in New York City um, just sweating it out, uh, writing this book, and whenever he needed factual information, you know, he could go to a, a, a library that he belonged to to look up information or... Um, uh, talk to other people, but he he pretty much wrote this book continuously in in uh, just a little over two months, which is pretty phenomenal for uh, yeah, for a writer to produce a four three or four hundred hundred page book. It sounds like he was just tapped in that like he was just yeah. downloading torrents of of yeah. just inspiration. Do you uh, that? I, I guess I maybe there's a two part question here. Do you know? I don't know if we've ever covered this in any of our discussions about Melville, but if you know any, you know, I've been kind of playing around with the idea of maybe writing a book one day. Maybe I, I've never written a book of fiction. I don't even know how to do it. And I'm kind of curious, did he have a, a process for how he did this? I mean, he just, or he, did he just like channel some otherworldly inspiration and, or was well, he, or, or I mean, is this like usually, just autobiographical? Yeah. I mean, is he just kind of just telling us what's going on in his life? Is, is he just really, is this kind of like a diary? What's going on here? Yeah. 
Well, Melville is is well known for using parts of his life in his fiction, but he's never writing straight autobiography, and so he's writing uh, this book uh, because partly his own brother was actually shipping out for the first time at an age of a, that Redburn is is supposed to be about you know fifteen sixteen because um, Melville himself was nineteen and then turned 20 uh, during the time covered by the book. But he himself um, went to Liverpool on a ship called the St. Lawrence in June, uh, you know, 1839. So it, he was writing about ten, exactly 10 years after he himself uh, signed on as a common seaman uh, for a uh, merchant marine vessel going to uh, Liverpool from New York with American, you know, cotton in the hold. That was the main uh, export uh, going from New York to Liverpool at this point. And uh, although that actually isn't mentioned at all, it's kind of surprising. Um, although it, I think it's briefly mentioned in, in Liverpool, but um, he, uh, you know, he he probably had some of the experiences that the young Redburn had on the ship. I mean, the the red character Redburn is obviously a tyro and he doesn't know anything and uh, he's constantly um, uh, taunted by the other sailors and that kind of thing. Right. And, you know, that may have happened a little bit to Melville, but uh, certainly, and some of the characters that he describes on the... Uh, um, the Highlander, you know, which is the fictional boat, they, he might have known those characters. We don't know for sure. I mean, there's, a, there's actually a whole book written about um, Melville's early life in Redburn by a guy named William uh, uh, Gilman. It came out in the 50s, and it's still interesting to read, uh, but we cool. still don't know much about exactly who is on the ship that he that he went out to uh, Liverpool on. But we can assume that some of the experiences might have, uh, you know, been those of Melville. But Melville is creating a fictional um, prototype who's a lot more naive and, uh, and immature than he himself was when he went, you know, out at the age of 19. Uh, that, that raises an interesting question. That raises an interesting question that I, I just wanted to ask you since we've done so many of these discussions on Melville. Do you have a favorite biographer uh, of Melville? Well, could you recommend any? Because because <laughs> that's that's the thing is because he he weaves himself into these novels. Yeah. It'd be interesting for the for those of us who are um, just getting acquainted with Melville to be able to see when um, the yeah. fictional character is there and when the real yeah. autobiography is occurring. Yeah. Um, I know. I know it's a little off script, but I, I just, I just wonder if you, if you were a big fan of someone off the top of your head. Yeah, I. Well, the ultimate biographer of Melville is Herschel Parker because he has written a two-volume life that is stupendous in its, um, in its exploration of of Melville's life in full uh you know each volume is, is 6 or 7 or 800 pages so you're right. getting a lot of information there and, it, and you know it's beautifully written so it's not hard to read as long as you have the time um right. what it doesn't cover as much is is some of the you know it's not a critical biography it's it's more just getting all the pieces of Melville's life together because it's been it's taken decades to assemble the information because Melville was not saving uh, information knowing that he would be a famous writer you know he he destroyed a lot of his letters and it was uh, almost 30 years uh, before an actual biography came out uh, you know 30 years after his death uh, that we finally got um, the first real biography which is f deeply flawed because of its lack of information about Melville's life um, you know, uh, so Parker's two volumes are just stupendous uh, in terms of factual information. Um, they're really, I can't really recommend um, anything else recently. I mean, some of the more recent critical biographies are, are flawed because they're marred by academic, you know, PC crap and tendentious about one thing or another. Mm -hmm. um, or just kind of 
uninformed about you know some new criticism and scholarship. Um, so uh, you know it'll be a long time before anyone tries a a, a new uh, biography to rival Parker. Although a guy named John Bryant is going to be publishing one fairly soon, and I think he's going to have some different approaches to cover material that Parker left out, or maybe some contextual um, matters, um, because, I mean, Parker spent his lifetime digging up all the information he could about Melville, going through innumerable archives and reading innumerable old newspapers, uh, I mean, he's just an incredible researcher, he's still, still, still working um, hasn't really published that, uh, that much in the last couple of years, but he did publish a book called Melville Biography, I think in 2014, which is a fascinating uh, compilation of his, uh, some of his uh, descriptions of his uh, work as a scholar um, working on Melville, you know, and the, and the benefits of archival research, which really so few people are doing these days because uh, it's not fashionable. That's some great um, information, yeah. Yeah, but I mean, there's some older biographies that you can read, like Leon Howard wrote one that's still pretty well informed. Of course, it doesn't have a lot of the more recent information uh, that's been discovered, but it, it presents a solid sense of the flow of Melville's life and where his different works fit into his uh, his career, so... I have to see if I can find something and get up to speed in a hurry because I feel like I'm always like trying to yeah get the timeline of this dude's life down yeah. uh, through his books and I think maybe I should just go and consult the timeline. Yeah. Um, well, y you know what's interesting? Uh, well, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Oh, I think you were going to say something else. No, no, no. Go ahead. Okay. Um, you know what's interesting? I, I think you mentioned earlier that. Redburn uh, qualifies as a form of realism. I mean, I, 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 maybe not. I might be putting words into your mouth. Yeah. This is the hard thing for, you know, as someone who's devoted most of his academic life to philosophy. Yeah. Um, you know, people can throw around philosophical categories and sub subcategories, and I can kind of automatically track what we're talking about. I, but those terms. There's a whole other lexicon when we talk about literature and, 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 and nested hierarchies or whatever. So what genre are we talking about with Red Yeah, Man? well, okay, so Melville, you know, he's writing in the, the, the tradition of realism, um, although, you know, technically he's a, he's a writer who's caught up in the Romantic movement, American Romanticism, but he is um, narrating, uh, you know, it's a story with, that, that's supposed to identify with, with you know, day-to-day -day life in, in its time. But the genres that you could um, associate with this book are two. One is the picaresque, and the other is the buildings roman. You know, it's interesting. Yeah. Interesting. One of you guys have... One of them is literature people have literature people have better names for the categories <laughs> of, of things that they say. We don't have we don't have these flowery titles. Everything's like just academic jargon. Well, uh, it's interesting because you know picaresque comes from a Spanish tradition of novels about the picaro, who's you know could be translated as the rogue, and it's about a a lower class character surviving on the edges of society. And um, it's very, it's kind of episodic in form, so you don't have any long lines of narrative continuity. I mean, each new chapter sometimes introduces a whole new situation or few chapters. So, uh, and it often involves humor or satire about the structure of society. And certainly, you get that in in Redburn. Um, in fact, I think Redburn is directly building on. Uh, what is called the nautical picaresque, which was kind of developed by Tobias Smollett in the 18th century. Um, and, um, you know, Melville read Smollett. Uh, we have records of that. Um, and, um, but the other genre is the Bildungsroman, which is a German word, which, you know, means kind of like formation. Um, yeah, like coming of age. Yeah, and it's about 
the first Bildungsroman officially is Wilhelm Meister of, of Goethe, you know, and mm. um, which was a fairly influential book published in the early, late, uh, what, 18th century. Um, and Melville read that. It was translated by Thomas Carlyle into English, I think, in the 1820s. And uh, so you, uh, this this tradition was uh, the f the the formation of a young man and his um, progress from uh, you know his small community, his town, his village, or whatever, into the great world, and uh, his mastery of a profession is something that often ended the book and his. His navigation through the moral shoals of city life often forms a part of this tradition, as well as uh, a possible romantic liaison. Uh, and so it's a, it's a novel of maturity um, that you find in German literature, especially in the late 18th, early 19th century, and then in English literature. I mean, you could, you could classify a lot of Dickens um, and um, other later writers as as writing in this tradition, uh, loosely conceived, you know. Uh, so really, it's Melville manages to to blend these two genres very very uh, interestingly in in Redburn, and he you know he knew examples of both traditions. Um, so that's that's uh, something that I've contemplated writing about as I, there hasn't really been enough discussion of, of the literary context of this book so so how would your how would your proper label go the you know what would I call it yeah yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I, I want to hear uh, the ring you know, I wanna, a, a, picaresque, flows a picaresque buildings roman ah there we go there we go yeah. I like it it's got a, got a nice ring yeah so I was wondering if you would mind discussing uh, Wellingborough Redburn's experience of Liverpool in relation to his father's guidebook. Yeah, well, this this uh, section of the book gets a fair amount of commentary because um, one of the first things that the young Wellingborough Redburn does when he gets off his ship when they've docked in Liverpool, you know, he has, uh, what, six weeks of time in the port, and he they, he really doesn't have to do much besides do a few odd jobs on the ship in the afternoon and you know take his meals uh, at, a, at a local inn. Um, but one of the first things he does is take a guidebook to, that belonged to his father and try to use it to explore the, the city of Liverpool. And, um, you know, he makes this uh, astonishing discovery that this guidebook, which you know, dates from the beginning of the 19th century is now out of date as of his visit to the to the city of Liverpool in roughly 1839. Uh, mainly because he's looking for these buildings that aren't there or he's uh, he's looking for a particular um, uh, dock that's supposed to be there and has now been filled in. So the, the city has developed significantly in, in the four decades since this guidebook was written. So it really is uh, it's a confirmation of the fact that you know every generation has to write its own books and live its own experiences in a way that is beyond any kind of um, moral guidance from from previous generations I mean it's kind of like the Emersonian idea that uh, you know we have to create the world anew with any every generation except now Redburn is saying that it's not that it's going to be good for us, it's it's just that we have to do it of necessity because the older books sometimes don't apply anymore. Although, you know, when he talks about this in the book, he makes an exception at the end of this this sort of elegiac passage. Uh, he makes an exception for the Bible, you know. He says there's one holy book that, that is going to guide you through anything. So, you know, this is a character who is still traditionally devout uh, in a way that Melville you know probably was when he was a teenager but now writing as a as a uh, full-fledged author in 1849 you know he's using Christianity sort of as a um, as a prop for his 
for his character um, because he definitely begun to sort of skeptical journey that he continued in uh, into the 1850s. You know, when he's writing Moby Dick and Pierre. Um, you, you you raise something that's of great intrigue to me, and I wonder if you could just say a line or two about it. I know I'm asking some rabbit tra trail questions, but this idea of every generation having to write the books anew, with the yeah. exception of the Bible. And you said this is an Emersonian idea, but this is kind of a philosophy of literature, a philosophy of history question. Um, you, I guess, in general, if you could encapsulate kind of shortly why we constantly need these new books, right? I guess, I guess when, when we're growing up in our, in our formal education, it's that, oh, the yeah. history just keeps repeating itself. It's yeah. not making progressions necessarily, that there's nothing new under the sun. But it seems like what you're saying here is that the landscape keeps changing. Therefore, yeah. we need to have new books in order well, to kind of make sense of the reality that we find ourselves birthed into. Is that, is that the Emersonian idea? I, just, I wanted a little well, clarification on that because I find that very philosophically interesting from like a Hegelian perspective and et cetera. Well, I mean, I refer to Emerson because the American scholar, uh, he says that, um, you know, we have to cut our ties with Europe and, and declare ourselves more intellectually independent and create something new for ourselves because we can't be beholden to the past, to our revolutionary forefathers or to all of the towering figures of Europe because we'll end up as dwarves uh, if we do that. But I think... In this case, I think Melville is reflecting the idea that, you know, the forces of modernity are such that progress is happening faster and faster so that we uh, can no longer just look back for, um, you know, easy moral reference. So, I mean, this is a phenomenon that's uh, been happening throughout human history, but especially since the Renaissance, obviously, you know, because in, in the Middle Ages, if you wanted to understand life, you read the authorities. You know, you read Aristotle, you read the Bible, you read uh, whatever the great theologians were writing. But um, as the pace of life picked up and the, with the Enlightenment and the liberation from authority, um, of course the world is going to be, uh, you know, recognizably changing faster and faster. So... I mean, that's the threat now is <laughs> things happen so fast and knowledge increases so fast that uh, we're just, everyone is just struggling to keep up. And that's why academic disciplines, you know, get more and more fractured because there's too much material to get the big picture. Uh, so it, it's an interesting point in, in uh, world history, you know, 1839, mm. um, because it's just after... They have invented these rotary presses, and the explosion of print is happening in a way that is much more significant than any time since the invention of you know movable type in Gutenberg. Because 1820s, 1830s, there, you know, you can really start cranking out a lot of books and newspapers at this point uh, in a way that you could not before that. And then, of course, you had the telegraph in the 1840s new means of transportation, steamships and trains. So life is really, uh, you know, industrialism is really taking off at this point. And I, and I think that's, uh, you know, has to be considered as the background for, for what Redburn is, is saying in this particular book, especially in England, because it's the leading um, country in terms of industrial uh, development, you know. It's such a fascinating idea to consider. I know we have to get back to the particular discussion of Redburn, but with such telescoping of history, it's like you almost start to wonder if the novel is even relevant any, anymore because by the time you've written something, history's gone and changed. And so, <laughs> yeah, you know, are, are we really, in order to understand our reality, are we starting to record it in something more... Fr um, more digital? Are we doing it through, I don't know, YouTube videos rather than the, yeah. the novel, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. This is all, it's all very highly speculative if, you know, podcasts and YouTube yeah. videos are taking the place of, of novels in order for us to understand what we're living in. But that's, that's a rabbit trail that we'll save for yeah. another day. I think um, the next thing I wanted to ask you is, you know, what was uh, Redburn's, you know, response to the 
the passing sights that he encountered in Liverpool. You know, the the poverty, the the vice, and the crime. Yeah, uh, well, that's something that interests me in particular um, because it it just shows you. I mean, Liverpool was notorious for some of its uh, um, uh, slum areas uh, because it was the biggest port of England. You know, all the tr- all the uh, uh, shipping that went to America, you know, went through Liverpool, um, and it was a huge depot for British trade around the world. So you had uh, lots of dock space and warehouses and transient populations, you know, so incredible amounts of prostitution, poverty, um, uh, you know, begging, and you have that horrible scene of the woman in, in that Lancelot's hay, you know, this this small street that Redburn walks down, and he sees this woman uh, in a sort of cellar area of a warehouse with two children next to her, and, you know, she's obviously, she's got her head drooped down, and she's obviously starving to death, and, you know, Redburn is shocked that no one is really interested in helping this poor woman, you know, and it turns out when he tries to talk to a local woman about aiding this person, she knows that who this person is, and the hint is that you know she had these children out of wedlock, and so she's kind of a pariah in the community. And you know Redburn goes to the police and tries to get them to come and help the woman, and no one does anything. He himself brings water to her and some bread, but. These, uh, this family is so far gone that, you know, the woman is dead a couple of di- days later. Um, and uh, he's, uh, you know, gets very upset by the fact that this obvious case of destitution was completely ignored by the rest of the population, which I guess is something that he doesn't think would happen in America. Um, there's more of a, you know, coherent, um, social um, um, togetherness. Uh, and the other thing is it, it's kind of a failed uh, parable of the of the Good Samaritan, you know, because he tries to be a Good Samaritan and um, tries to help this woman, but sh- she's already too far gone to receive any assistance. So, um, you know, he can't be a hero and, and do do what he thinks the that he's morally obliged to do. Uh, But the other thing is he sees all of these beggars around the docks and the way they display their um, worthiness to uh, to get you know a little bit of a charity. Uh, So it's a real kind of gruesome scene of people missing limbs and uh, and other people who are faking injuries and then uh, he encounters a guy who's trying to get him to buy some stolen uh, property, and uh, you know this is a very common thing. These weird guys who, who follow you around and go try to go up to you in a corner and say, "Hey, you know, look at what I have. Do you want it?" Uh, knowing it's stolen property. Um, so this is a symptom of the disruption of industrialism in England at this time. You know. Uh, because it was a very stressful time in the late 1830s, early 1840s, you had a movement called Chartism, which was an attempt to assert some of the rights of the working class and uh, reform Parliament so that you know these these new constituencies would get more representation, uh, and there'd be more attention to you know the idea of a living wage. Because you know early industrialism in England was just a nightmare in terms of living conditions and they you know they're working 12 hours a day and they're you know they're barely surviving so this is the world of um, you know uh, Eng- Frederick Engels wrote, wrote the condition of the working class in England based on uh, things like this uh, you know published in the 1840s um, so so Melville like other writers like Engels and you know some of the British writers investigating this are Carlyle um, and uh, you know it was a it was a feature of, of British some British fiction and of course this is the world that Dickens matured into because uh, he's writing his first books in the late 1830s uh, so Melville himself is is just drawing the American reader uh, 
uh, drawing attention to the the horrors of industrialism, or or at least the the horrors of a of a port city that is very much tied into the economic changes of the last few decades. Um, yeah, it's going to prove to be very important. Yeah. I, I was wondering, could, could you tell us more about the significance of this character, Harry Bolton? Yeah, well, Harry Bolton is a, is a wonderful creation of Melville who shows up when, uh, towards the end of Melville's, uh, Redburn's stay in Liverpool. You know, he meets him there, and he's a peculiar guy because he's, he's really down on his luck, and he really he belongs to this category of upper-class characters called dandies you know the dandies were these <laughs> yeah. were these uh uh you know young men who tr- dressed dressed kind of foppishly and usually they had family money and they were sort of um asserting their um artistic and intellectual um, independence in their behavior the da- yeah the dandy is such an interesting phenomenon to me i don't think i've really i i I stared it down a little bit more face to face with um with uh Baudelaire. He was sort of yeah. a proud dandy yeah. when I was doing a lot of yeah. research on him. Um do you think there's like a, an analog to it today to ha- maybe to help well, the audience kind of understand what a dandy is? Well, the first big I, I, some people would uh, yeah. do, some people would some people might describe it as a hipster <clears throat> or something like that. Yeah, it's an know. odd I don't know phenomenon. if that's appropriate. Because the first big dandy was this guy named Bo Brummel, who, you know, he had money, but he eventually went bankrupt. But he dressed impeccably. I mean, the first characteristic of the dandy is he has perfect taste, and he creates his own kind of standards of dress and behavior. And and both of them can be a little eccentric, uh, well, especially the behavior, because, uh, you know, the dandy is someone who is... Uh, declares himself to be different from everyone, and uh, he definitely occupies a privileged space, and he could have sort of artistic leanings, um, but there's a whole uh, sort of network of dandies who were, you know, the social dandy is different sort of from the artistic or intellectual dandy like Baudelaire because in England they were we, they were social dandies and often they were living um you know by spending their family money and gambling and um not really contributing to bourgeois society i mean they're the opposite of the hard working um husband or family man because they're independent they're not married and uh they assert their unique uh, identity apart from any kind of traditional authority. I uh, feel like we need an infographic to trace the evolution yeah. of the dandy. <laughs> there well, seem to be many species of dandy. Well, there's some good books on the figure. There's some some good uh, uh, 19th century writing on this subject. Do you have Do you have a recommendation off the top of your head? Um, well, the the dandy. Um, it was by a, a, a woman academic at Columbia, Ellen Moores, M-O-E-U-R-S. Her book is a good introduction, but there are a couple of other books. But in any event, Harry Bolton is uh, hes an out-of-luck, run-down dandy who is... He's notable because he has a lot of ridiculous outfits and costumes that he wears around. And... Uh, um, he befriends Redburn, and Redburn admires him because he's a very handsome, beautiful young man. He looks very feminine, you know, and very polished um, exemplar of, you know, sort of British aristocracy or privileged life, you know, and he be- has a beautiful singing voice, and he knows all about society, you know, with a capital S, in that he's aware of the most fashionable opera singers in London and dancers, and he drops the name of people like, uh, you know, Lady Blessington, who was a famous hostess um, from the 1840s, um, 30s and 40s. So uh, this guy, Harry Bolton, is a uh, an interesting 
complex character because he's 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 escaping from his past and we don't really know what he's done but he's kind of run through his inheritance um, and he's trying to make a living somehow because he doesn't have any more money and you know he signs on to this ship to sail back to uh, New York with Redburn and he experiences all the same ridicule and taunting that Redburn did on the way out because Harry doesn't know anything about sailing he has vertigo <laughs> when he when he tries to climb into the rigging you know he claims he's gonna fall off because he has that's, all that's the wrong cool. clothing for the for the I, voyage you know what a hysterical transition to go from dandy to yeah to like sea dog yeah <laughs> well the other Is uh it? The other well, he's a comic butt in the second half of the or the last third right. of the book for a few chapters. But the other fascinating part of Harry Bolton's story is that when he convinces Redburn to go to London with him, you know, because in Liverpool, you at that point you could catch a train to London uh, for go for a few hours and and you're there, um, you know, in 1839. So they abscond from Liverpool, and and Redburn knows that. Um, it's probably likely that even though he doesn't show up for a couple of days on the ship, that they're not going to uh, fire him if he shows up again because he's already signed on at this incredible cheap rate at three dollars for the whole voyage. You know, so they're not going to find anyone who's uh, ha whom they have to pay less than Redburn. So he agrees to go to London because he has this romantic idea of England and London that he's obsessed with, and they get to London. And they really don't see anything except uh, Harry drags him to this very mysterious gentleman's club, which eventually is named as something called Aladdin's Palace. Um, and if you do the research, as I've done, actually I published an article on this particular subject, it's clear that Harry Bolton is taking Redburn to the most famous gentleman's club of the era, which was called Crockford's in the 1830s and it was the place where the most fashionable young men went and usually they would uh, you know lose a lot of money um, uh, playing um, various uh, you know gambling games um, and um, um, so you know hazard they had a you know these dice games and card games so what happens is basically Harry is trying to go to this gambling club and somehow make a killing so he doesn't have to actually ship out to go to America. He's, you know, this is his last chance to avoid this fate. And of course, he loses all his money. Come, you know, he leaves Redburn in the club in this room with all these kind of lewd pictures on the wall and all of the sort of mystery about where where he is exactly but you know very luxurious furniture and carpeting and pictures and things like that um, so Harry leaves Redburn in this in this lounge area and then shows up you know late that night having lost all his money and is talking about you know killing himself and makes Redburn take his his um, his knife away from him because so he doesn't you know, use it on himself. Right. Um, so uh, it's a it's an amazing picture of the of the vice of riches. You know, in in Liverpool you get the vice and misery of poor people, but here you have the vice and misery of you know the wealthy and the aristocrats. You know, so Melville is giving a sort of global image of English society you know, at the very bottom and the middle and at the very top in this image of uh, Aladdin's club. And the other interesting thing about this club is that, you know, a lot of academics in the last few decades have assumed that it had to be a sort of male brothel and that Harry, when he went off, was, you know, having some kind of fling with some guy in a back room. But, I mean, that's a totally um, unhistorical idea and uh, doesn't really match the evidence you find in the book um, which is clearly modeled on this one particular famous club of the era Crockford's you know everyone was who went to London knew about it and it was a notorious place for upper-class uh, Englishmen to spend their family fortunes you know eventually there was legislation in the 1840s uh, 
to limit gambling, and this club, you know, eventually closed. It was on it's on St. James Street, um, which runs into Piccadilly. So it's near right. Buckingham Palace. So it's right in the center of the West End, where you know the most fashionable people would be found. Um, West End girls, <laughs> remind me of the song. Um, Two questions, two-parter. Yeah, I want yeah. I wanted to give you an opportunity to plug the article that you wrote on this, uh, yeah. on this particular issue. And then second of all, do you think that Melville reveals anything um, insightful about the vices of excess in this episode? Yeah. Well, first of all, the article was published in the Melville Journal called Leviathan, uh, and it's called Mis- Redburn's Mysterious Visit to London. Um, okay. Uh, I think it's about 2005 or so. Um, But I do a very thorough uh, research of the writing uh, about gambling and uh, the story of this club of Crockfords. It's a a fascinating story. In fact, there's a book about it uh, by a British social historian. Um, and, uh, And it's totally accurate because this... This club was famous for wiping out these these family fortunes of some British, uh, you know, upper class young men. And uh, um, did it target and, them or something? I mean, it's off topic. Yeah, tar- yeah, yeah. Topic, yeah. It did. Yeah, and definitely, this guy uh, Crockford was the name of the proprietor. Uh, I mean, he did everything he could to lure people in. I suppose he had, you know, the famous chef there, so he had really good food. And he had really classy people as members, and some, a lot of them didn't gamble, some of the older people. Um, but it was the young men, you know, he'd go in the back rooms, and all of this was legal. I mean, it's kind of like Atlantic City today, um, that you could do this, and, you know, at the time, no one could blame the proprietor, because they're, they're, these games, I think the big game at this point was, uh, you know, this dice came of Hazard, called Hazard. Um, and, um, and eventually there was a parliamentary uh, commission to study the matter, and some laws were passed in the 1840s because, um, you know, this was a serious social problem. In the 1820s and 30s, you read about it in English social history, gambling, uh, you know, there's always been gambling, uh, and gambling's, you know, sometimes they're called gambling hells because, um, you know, it suits the environment that you find in a, in a gambling parlor. Um, but these became much more uh, common after the Napoleonic Wars were over and there was new money and uh, uh, young men um, were not getting killed in the, in the wars in continental Europe. So the 1820s and 1830s, uh, gambling really exploded in England and, and became a real um, problem, uh, as I mentioned, so that they had to actually launch a commission to scale it back. So that's why you don't really read about this as much in the fiction of the 1850s or 60s. But, I mean, you hear about it in, if you read the novels of Benjamin Disraeli of the mm. 1830s and 40s, a lot of the young men, you know, he he's always writing about these upper-class young men. Um, and uh, a lot of their time is spent in these gambling hells in in, in London. Uh, you know, novels like Coningsby uh, or The Young Duke is one where you actually hear about uh, Crockford's directly uh, from the 1830s. Um, these are these are kind of fun novels to read. They're I mean they're a little clunky today, and they have a sort of uh, formulaic uh, structure, but they're they're still enjoyable to read. Interesting. I've never really thought of gambling associated with the English, but that oh, could, yeah, just a crazy of, blind yeah. spot in my. <laughs> yeah, I, when I think of gambling, I just I, I have a very American. Well, you read about Dostoevsky. Yeah, yeah. I mean, gambling. You know, the thing about Redburn is the the scene at Aladdin's Palace. It really reminds you of the of the novelette or the novella of uh, Dostoevsky called The Gambler. Um, huh. Because there's this kind of aura of hysteria and and uh, suicide and uh, addiction that you that you read about in Dostoevsky, because of course he himself was addicted to gambling um, in a way that Melville never was. So 
Gambling has always mystified me. I, I'm I'm so risk averse. I can't yeah, even. I, I would I wouldn't even gamble a dollar on anything. I'm I'm kind of the same, you know. <laughs> it's such a strange. It, it's a very real pathology, but I mean, I just it's yeah. it's a, it's one of those that I'm. It's hard for me to identify with. Um. So I guess I wanted you to talk a little bit about the depiction of Irish immigrants on the uh, yeah return voyage of the Highlander to New York. Can you say something about that? Yeah, well, that's another feature of the last third of the book when the when the ship comes uh, starts sailing back to the to New York because uh, they hit some really bad weather. It's it, traditionally it took a little longer to sail back um, to the United States from Britain um, because of the uh, currents, I guess, um, and. Um, so w- the the ship is taking hundreds of immigrants from Liverpool to New York, and when Melville uh, took his sh- uh, trip on the St. Lawrence in 1839, um, he you know they have a few passengers, uh, paying passengers, but uh, almost certainly there were no uh, immigrants in his ship. So this he invented this. Um, and he, what he's really doing is referring to the massive influx of Irish immigrants that took place, starting with the Irish famine, you know, in the mid 1840s. So he's, you know, writing in 1849. He's including a scene from something just a few years back um, that was still a national disaster in Ireland, and um, so, uh, and he's really drawing attention to the the terrible conditions that these immigrants face when they were shipping themselves off because the 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 companies would underestimate the amount of time it took the ships to tra- travel across the Atlantic, so they wouldn't bring enough food, as 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 Relling, you know, Melville mentions in his narrator, and um, uh, disease breaks out because of the terrible. Uh, hygiene uh, of of these people all forced to um, you know inhabit this very confined space in the ship, especially when they're in bad weather, they have to close all the hatches, so they're all in the hold of the ship or in this you know this sort of uh, areas of um, uh, you know uh, confined space. So what happens is epidemic disease breaks out. Well, he doesn't mention it. This is probably typhoid fever, which was a common uh, killer for transatlantic immigrants in these, these ships. So they're, they're, people are dying every day um, because of these uh, insanitary conditions, and they're not allowed to go onto the deck. Um, and um, so what, what you're seeing is Melville drawing attention to a terrible social issue of uh, the second half of the 1840s, really, and, uh, you know, trying to make people aware just how uh, difficult it was for these immigrants to enter the U.S. And, you know, of course, there was a beginnings of an anti-immigrant movement in the U.S. at the time, and Melville is basically saying that, you know, if these people can somehow get to the U.S., we shouldn't keep them out because... Um, all they want to do is find a chance to make a living and reestablish themselves after having to leave their homelands for whatever reason. You know, of course, Ireland had gone through this terrible potato famine in 1846, 1847, and, you know, uh, a million Irish died during this episode, and uh, untold numbers immigrated to the U.S., into New York, into Baltimore, into Boston, into New Orleans, uh, but mainly in Philadelphia, but um, majority in New York, you know. So. I need to study up on that potato famine. I always think about Ireland just being so green and lush, like that just one crop yeah. goes down and it totally decimates. Well, it was it, it was because society. they were so dependent on potatoes, and this one um, parasite attacked the crop and it just devastated it. I mean, it you know it happens with single crops in the U.S. where, but everyone knows that you have to have different varieties and um, uh, you have to be prepared for uh, new. Um, um, you know, they just didn't have any of other li- They just didn't have any livestock or, or any other. No, thing they were so poor. On. I mean, they're so mm-hmm. dirt poor. They're they're farming yeah. these tiny little, uh, 
plots and just raising enough food to feed themselves. And of course, a lot of the problems stem from the fact that a lot of the country was owned by British landlords who were just getting rent from their estates and living uh, the good life in London or somewhere else in England, right? So a lot of the country was owned by British landlords, and that caused a whole, you know, uh, uproar. Yeah. So. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that raises the whole other question about the why the British weren't more attentive to the needs of the Irish, if you know. Yeah. They had an empire that covered a quarter of the world at that time, or right about there. Is that, is that right? Do I have my history right? Yeah, I mean, Ireland was the, the big issue later in the century. Of course, was home rule, which didn't mean independence. It just means that you know they wanted to have a parliament of their own to make their own laws. Uh, and then you know, eventually in 1919, they they finally got their independence after some uh, serious violence. Um, but crazy stuff topic for another day yeah but definitely gives us an insight into that what about this uh tyrannical sailor jackson what can you tell about tell us about him and how yeah he, well uh, he's he's guess, probably guess, the most yeah. fascinating passenger um he uh you know redburn meets him on the voyage out to liverpool and he's sort of this sickly character who's doesn't have any hair in his head i mean he's obviously suffering from mysterious diseases i mean it's it's not indicated what he's actually um afflicted by but uh, he ends up uh spitting out blood and dying on the voyage back uh so he clearly has some tb but the other killer that he might uh be afflicted with is syphilis you know which was the if you're a sailor, you're you're going to be um, you know vulnerable to venereal diseases, especially syphilis. But Redburn is uh, is horrified and fascinated by this guy Jackson because uh, it see he seems to be sort of the prototype of the misanthrope who's looked at all the evils of the world and has become sort of morally corrupted by them. Because that's what Redburn himself is facing on this trip is how to accommodate the fact that the world is is a very disappointing and uh, unkind and um, difficult place to survive in, you know, and uh, when he sees this guy who uh, just sort of uh, doesn't believe in anything, you know, first of all he doesn't believe in God, and then he has the most cynical ideas about human nature, uh, Redburn is really terrified that he's going to be, you know, kind of afflicted with this guy's moral corruption. It's almost like he's going to catch a disease from him, you know. So he's very wary about um, being around the guy. Uh, but he has some very interesting comments about him. I mean, he compares him to Milton's Satan um, yeah. as an image of sort of, you know, e embodiment of evil. Um, but on the other hand, the characterization um, doesn't veer into allegory. I mean, he's always a very under interesting, fascinating study in uh, corruption, and you know, he tyrannizes over all the other sailors because they're terrified of him because he's he's so intimidating, uh, because he's so uh, um, controlling of the other sailors, and he eventually dies on just before they get to New York. Uh, of one of these illnesses that he has, and um, um, and you know Redburn is is horrified by his death, but he still has an element of sympathy for the guy because he knows that you know somehow this guy's life has just been destroyed by his uh, career as a sailor and his um, you know lack of faith in, in, in people and and God as well. Um, it's kind of, you know, people think of it as sort of a uh, foreshadowing of the character of Ahab, but on the other hand, Ahab is a much more commanding and impressive sort of Shakespearean hero. I mean, uh, Re uh, um, Jackson is uh, sort of a minor, you know, sort of devil figure in the in the pantheon of Melville characterizations. Um, but you know he's he fills in some of the dramatic territory of the return voyage, along with the immigrants 
um, because uh, Redburn himself, there's not much description about what he's doing on the return voyage. It's more about Harry Bolton failing as a sailor, what the immigrants are going through with some of the people on the ship. Uh, so Harry, uh, I'm sorry, Redburn has mastered the art of of being a sailor, so we don't really have any descriptions of him doing any sort of bumbling things and getting reprimanded by the captain or the first mate or whatever. Very interesting. So I guess maybe just in conclusion you could yeah. tell us, and we've talked a little bit about this, but maybe in conclusion you could tell us about how this relates into Melville's larger corpus. Yeah, well this book, it got good reviews. Uh, people liked it. They realized it's, it's very readable. Um, um, uh, you know, people, uh, contemporary readers, uh, you know, they enjoyed the accessible Melville. Of course, Type P was was their favorite because it just has such a sort of magical aura about it. But this, this was a you know a fairly well uh, solid selling book for Melville for a while. I mean, it never really stood out from his other work. Um, but you know, the picaresque element in the story. Uh, would later show up in Israel Potter, as as I think we we talked about, and of course the character of Jackson, you know, anticipates Ahab to some small degree, um, and uh, you know, Wellingboro Redburn has a few elements of Ishmael as a sort of philosophical observer of the world and a struggling Christian who is who's sort of uh, you know also a skeptic. Um, so, um, you know, the book was, was always considered to be one of Melville's early successful attempts to, to be a traditional storyteller. And, um, uh, so, uh, and it really should have more readers today than I think it does. I'm actually about to teach it to one of my classes now. Um, but it's, a uh, it deserves a place in the bookshelf of you know coming of age stories, American coming of age stories, um, and um, tells a lot of uh, as far as understanding some of the issues of early industrialism. It's 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 really good for that. In the same way that some of Melville's short fiction drew attention to the issue, like uh, the Paradise of Bachelors and the Tartarus of Maids. You know that two-part story. And the second yeah. part shows women working in the mills of uh, paper mills of, of New England, you know, at uh, these long, uh, uh, boring routines and not getting paid for it. So uh, it anticipates the sort of social Melville that we can find in uh, some of his some of his books. And of course, it has some fascinating comments about the status of Christianity in. 19th century England and America, you know, because Redburn is complaining about the, the woman in Lancelot's hay in that street in Liverpool. You know, all these people are just ignoring her, and this this is such a, a blatant contradiction of the ethics of the New Testament, you know, of charity and serving others and, um, you know, selfless giving. It's, it's uh, so he's really highlighting that huge um, chasm between the tr doctrines of Christianity that are preached every Sunday and the day-to-day -day reality of um, modern life where people do their best to ignore what they heard on Sunday. <laughs> Ain't that the truth? Yeah. Well, that was one of the things that I think struck me. I, you know, I... It was. I'm a couple of weeks away from the text, but I, I seem to recall this being one of the more, and maybe I'm I'm, mis, I'm mistaken here, but I seem to recall this being one of the more pro-Christian. Yeah, it is texts of Melville's. It, it, it seemed is. like. I mean, the yeah, standard. I, 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 that was my impression. The standard is still there. I mean, Melville, uh, even though he himself was moving, inching towards a more skeptical mindset. He allows Redburn to embody the ideals of Christianity that are failing in the world around him. So he, he, he still holds that standard up as valid and shows the shortcomings. He's not at the point where he's going to say, uh, 
you know, we can't reach this benchmark anymore and we should just ignore it and uh, who knows whether Christianity is still relevant and it maybe sets an impossible standard for human behavior. Um, maybe the New Testament is based on, you know, a mythic uh, structure that was imposed on Jesus Christ as a historical figure. So a lot of these issues would come later in his writing, but now he is embracing the the Christian ideal uh, as a as a legitimate standard for his society. Yeah, I, all in all, I thought it was a great book, and I I truly enjoyed this discussion. Uh, yeah. It was wonderful to have on a Sunday afternoon. Yeah. So well, and, and I I think we should bring it to a close there and yeah. give us a little bit of time to talk about what we want to do next. Unless okay. there's anything else you'd like to say. No, no, I just encourage everyone to go out and pick up a copy. <laughs> Yes, as, as do I. Yeah, yeah, and I want to. I want to thank you, Doctor. Uh, say thank you to Doctor Cook for for teaching us today, and to pick up a copy of his book, Inscrutable Malice, which you can find on Amazon. And we've talked about that, and you can check our discussion on his book, Inscrutable Malice, to get a sense of what it's all about. I highly recommend it. Um, yeah, and just download the Noetic app, and we'll powwow a little bit and uh, figure out what we're going to do next. So take okay. care, everyone. Bye.